Too Much Information is a production of iHeartRadio. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Too Much Information, the show that brings you the secret histories and little-known fascinating facts and figures behind your favorite TV shows, movies, music, and more. We are your two night creatures of the nitty-gritty, your hounds of hellish history, your foul stenches of facts, parentheses, the funk of 40,000 years. I'm Alex Heigl. That's what he says, foul stenches? I, I'm not a Yeah, lyric. the lyrics to that rap are ridiculous. Wow. The funk of 40,000 years is pretty great, I gotta oh, say. That is great. Considering Michael Jackson was afraid of the word funky. <laughs> Hence, smelly jelly, if I believe? Yeah, no, okay. that's correct. Yeah. And I'm Jordan Runtog. There we go. And Jordan, today we're talking about the biggest Halloween song of all time. With an earth-shattering visual impact to match. Uh, that's right, we are talking about Michael Jackson's Thriller. Just the song in the video, though, not the record, because no. that would take days. Yes. Um, Halloween season came around, you were like, we should do another, like, what, what are the other music ones that we could do? And since we already did Monster Mash, I thought back to all the Halloween music compilations I've heard in my youth, and it's... <laughs> It's it's Monster Mash, yeah, Thriller, and then a bunch of horror movie soundtracks. That's all of them. <laughs> there's, there's the Purple People Eater, I guess, if you squint. Yeah, it's sort of an edge case, though. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, what do you say about Thriller, dude? I mean, it's no Monster Mash. But, That's true. That is true. But it's pretty, 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 <laughs> pretty good. Uh, yeah, sold a bajillion copies, revolutionized the art form of the music video, uh... Party standard from now on? Party standard, yeah, viral dance success, uh, Vincent Price got, like, I don't know, a couple grand for it, uh, <laughs> list goes on. It's nice to see black people ripping off old white men for a change. Ha <laughs> ha! Is that staying in? I don't know. <laughs> 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 Uh, I mean, yeah, again, what do you say, dude? It's like the national anthem of October. It's, it's in the firmament of American culture. There's like nothing. What? It's a, it's thriller. I don't think you shut up. It's <laughs> what do you have to say about it? I, this is going to get me into trouble, but it's not my favorite song on thriller <laughs> by a long That's shot. That's fair. It's in like my lower half. I, I Ooh. Let's, yeah. Okay. So in descending order, it, for me, it's all about Billie Jean. Did yeah. he come up with that bass line while driving over a bridge like the Bee Gees did when they came up with jive talking going over a bridge in Florida? It's just I like don't. the tires would hit the grooves in the road at a weird, weird rhythm. I, it makes it makes sense. I think that's um, I, maybe I, I might be making that up. So, but that's number know, one. Yeah. Uh, Want to be starting something? I think number two, it's got that great Soul Mucosa sample, which rips. Yeah. That song's incredible. Uh, let's see. PYT number three also rips. What is wrong with you that you have beat it so low? <sighs> it's, uh, it's too rocky for me. I like more of the <laughs> R&B stuff. It hurts my ears. It's still, it's still <laughs> <laughs> uh, the girl is mine is number four because Paul McCartney's got to be in the top half of whatever I'm ranking. Uh, although that song, I hate that fucking song. I, I know it sounds like an '80s sitcom theme. It sounds like the Family <laughs> yeah, Ties. Yeah, it does. Like na 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 na. Yeah. Uh, I just think of the uh, the. There's like a clip of there's like an interview clip of Paul McCartney doing like a withering Michael Jackson impression that's been like burned into my brain. Oh yeah. I think it's from, you know what I think it's from? I think it's from He's VH1's, it it's v, VH, well, the one that I'm thinking of is, was I remember it because VH1's 100 Most Shocking Moments in Rock and Roll came right. out when I was watching a lot of VH1 lists. And <laughs> um, yeah, it's when Michael Jackson bought the Beatles rights and, and Paul tells that story <laughs> about how on that video set, he was like, you know, the real, you know, the real money's in music publishing and uh, and and Michael says to him, "I'm gonna buy your songs." <laughs> wait, wait, we have a, we have to have like a like a trip like moment where how uh, Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon do like dueling Michael Caine impressions. Oh, okay. We gotta go <laughs> do dueling Paul McCartney doing Michael Jackson's. I'm gonna buy your songs. I'm gonna buy your songs, Paul. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, Girl Is My God, that song sucks. Uh, I, I know. Human Nature, a good mid-tempo cut, mm -hmm. and then I think I'm up to Thriller, and that's, so that's my, my sixth favorite song on Thriller is the title track. 
But I know we talked about this during our spooky season last year, which I know is a lot more uh, robust than this year's. I'm sorry. Uh, it's, I take full responsibility for that. But I, I'm not really into Halloween. I know. Um, I know. I know. But I, I love how much you love it. That makes me feel good. <laughs> I mean, it's great, man. I what what other like? It's the biggest artist of all time doing a Halloween song. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's like, like where I'm trying to think of what else. I mean, yeah, man. It'd be um, like, Mariah Carey, all I want for Christmas is you in terms yes, of like that's huge yes. artist, huge holiday. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. But I think like around the, for... but I think around the same time it would be, it would like, Oh God, we should just pitch other versions of this. What if the Eagles, because that's the only, the only band that sold higher than Michael. What Eagles if the, did Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving song. Yeah. That's what they would do. <laughs> That's exactly what they would do. Or 4th of July. I was no. going to say, I feel like mm. they would maybe do 4th of July. No, Beach Boys would do 4th of July. God, that would... Can you imagine how much that would suck? I'm sure they did do a 4th of July song at some point in their in their wilderness years that I've just not acknowledged. Hold, please. No, Eagles Thanksgiving. Maybe it's a bird, turkey, eagle thing? Nope, they sure do. 4th of July? But it actually seems to be dramatically anti-war. Oh, I think it's because it, it was written by Dennis. That's why. Uh okay, yeah. There is a uh, an excellent Bollywood version of Thriller. Okay, it was like it made the rounds on YouTube, like back when YouTube was was uh, was brand new. It was more pure. Do, have you ever heard it? <laughs> I don't think so. No, I oh, maybe. Yeah. I I just remember all the viral. I remember all the viral dance challenges. Well, no, that I mean, this is like actually good. Like I actually think like the baseline in it because it, it's such a wild rip. Like it's so clearly Thriller, but. It's like just different enough to not get sued, but the baseline of it, I kind of prefer. I want you Ooh. to, I want you to hear it and see what you have to say. You might remember this because I feel like it was big on like E Bombs World or something when we were freshmen in college. Live reacts. <laughs> No, this sucks. <laughs> it's awful. Really? <laughs> it's, that is the worst synth tone I've heard. Dancing's great, though. Yeah. Yeah. No, that sucks. Um, what else you got? <laughs> That's all I got. All right. <laughs> uh, well, from the silent songwriter behind the monster hit. To the truly mind-blowing sales records notched, to the landmark music video, here's everything you didn't know about Michael Jackson's Thriller. Necessarily quick thumbnail sketch before we dive in. Michael Jackson, obviously first rose to fame in the early 1970s, this is the adorable pint-sized frontman of Motown's Jackson 5. Uh, we get a quick uh, Super Sounds of the 70s style montage of him in the platform shoes dancing and then of Joe Jackson hitting him with a chair. Uh, the Jacksons left Motown in 1975 and released three albums on Epic, uh, the most contemporaneous of the time of which Destiny had peaked at number 11 on the Billboard 200 in 1978. But then Jackson became a bona fide global solo superstar with his first album for Epic under his own name, Off the Wall. Uh, when it came out in 1979, Epic made the then unusual move of promoting the album simultaneously to pop and R&B markets, which helped it become this just enormous crossover success. And then after that, uh, for Jackson and Quincy Jones, producer Quincy Jones, who is what if, 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 producer Quincy Jones, if, if producer Quincy. Yeah, if you don't know Quincy Jones, I can't help you. You're listening to the wrong podcast. <laughs> uh, Jones came back to help Jackson realize his vision of an album where every single song was a hit. That was what everyone who has been interviewed about Thriller said that they were going in and trying to do. Larry Williams, who played saxophone, flute, and synths on the album, said that to the New York Post in 2022. He said that was the mandate. I have a question for you, just and I, this may be something that requires my research. Offhand, what are some other albums that you can think of that Almost follow that same edict. I mean, the only one I can think of that comes close is Katy Perry. The Katy Perry, yeah, because yeah. she tied tied or broke the record of the most number ones on one album. From, yeah, um, um, I mean that that they set out to do ahead of time. 
Either way, either way. I don't know. That's a that's an interesting question because I feel like it would kind of either ahead of time or just in retrospect, like wow, every single one of these either was a hit or could have been a hit. I mean, even just going to the top list of all time. Hotel California, as much as I hate to admit it. I mean, Dark Side of the Moon is pretty up there. When you think of like every single song on that album is actually like a banger. Like the weakest song on there is like Eclipse. Oh, Any color I love you like. Yeah, maybe oh, like on, the on back. the run. On the run's the one I can't deal with. Well, it's an instrument. There, I mean, the, I'm talking about the instrumentals, but like when you think about like breathe time mm-hmm. great gig in the sky money us and them like those are all like those i mean it, it was fm radio rock so maybe that's yeah. a bit of a dark horse we gotta do dark side we got somebody requested that and uh back in black, a couple people dude. did oh yeah. yeah 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 i mean the thing about back in black is that it is not it's not all bangers but when you've got yeah i guess it really is only three on that man it's kind of hell's bells the title one you shook me the rest of them are all kind of, you know, 1989 AC/DC. maybe. Yeah, come on over. Oh, oh yeah, I don't that's know, a good dude. The rumors is rumors has filler on it. Like, oh, daddy, yeah, that song sucks. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Secondhand news sucks. Uh, oh, daddy also sucks. But the rest of these are all strong. Uh, yeah. All right. Hmm. Zeppelin four. Oh, uh, yeah, good. But but there's not that many songs on that. It's only an eight song record. The Cars debut. But they all I feel actually like. Ooh, man. Zeppelin 4 is for sure up there. The weakest one on Zeppelin 4 is like Battle of Evermore and Four Sticks. And then every one of those other songs smack. Black Dog, Rock and Roll, Stairway to Heaven, Misty Mountain Hop, Going to California, When the Levee no. Breaks. Like that's that's a high batting average uh, for a record. Cars debut. Sure. Car, uh, Adele, 21. I feel like 21 was really just like powered by uh, rolling, rolling in the deep. deep. Rolling in the Deep, Set Fire to the Rain, and Someone Like You. I'm going to say 1989 might have been the most recent. <laughs> Santana's Supernatural. Oh, oh, well, okay, yeah. Which Doesn't that share a, uh, a story with Thriller where they both basically had... Uh, engineers, engineers in on twenty four like twenty seven, yeah, yeah. twenty four hour in retainers, like gurneys when they were done, yeah. Um, interesting thought experiment. Maybe born in the USA. Oh, um, born or run I, maybe too. Nah, I don't think so. Really? Yeah. Want to elaborate on that? Uh, no. Born to run. Uh, born to run has born to run. Yeah. No. Oh. <laughs> David Lynch choice. <laughs> no. <laughs> Anyway. That's the David Cross in, in the rest of the development. Do you want to try that uh, a little bit simpler? <sighs> no. Asked in 2009 by Rolling Stone about Thriller, Quincy Jones was admirably uh, uh, forthright about the fact that it was a team effort. Uh, he said, Michael didn't create Thriller. It takes I a did. team. To- <laughs> Right, It takes a team to make an album. He wrote four songs and he sang his ass off, but he didn't conceive it. That's not how an album works. Real talk. Facts. Uh, aside from engineer Bruce Swedian. Sweden? Is that Sweden? really how you say his name? Sweden? Uh, Sweden. I'm going with Sweden. Sweden. Bruce Sweden. Who we'll get to. Uh, but English songwriter Rod Temperton is the guy who comes up most in the discussion of Thriller for good reason. Temperton is such a relentlessly low-key dude, though, that his nickname and the title of a documentary about his career by the BBC was The Invisible Man. (laughs) He grew up a a musical kid. I think both his parents were classically trained musicians. Uh, Grew up in Lincolnshire. And he eventually joined a multiracial disco funk band called Heatwave. Heatwave whips. Yeah, I imagine you pulled that out in your DJ nights. I pull that out at home. (laughs) <laughs> well, his biggest hits for the band Boogie Nights and the ballad Always and Forever were both million sellers, and they helped break the band in America, which is how Quincy Jones heard about him. Producer Barry Blue recalled to the BBC that despite this, Temperton was hardly living large at the time. He had a very small flat, so everything had to be done within one room, and he had piles of washing, and he had the TV on top of the organ. It was a nightmare. He had trams running outside, but he made it just absorbed himself in the music, and Rod seemed to come up with these amazing songs. 
So Rod left Heat Wave in 1978 after writing another hit for them, The Groove Line, uh, with the intention of focusing on his writing. It was not a career decision in the sense of I knew what I was going to do, he told the BBC. I had no idea where I was going. If I was any good, somebody will call me, I guess. Obviously, that person ended up being Quincy Jones, who, based on the Heat Wave hits, called Temperton in 1978 and liked his demos enough to fly him to L.A. on weekends to work on Off the Wall. Jones said in 2017 that Temperton had asked Jones to manage Heat Wave, but he wasn't interested in doing that. Uh, but they hit it off, and Temperton contributed Rock With You, Off the Wall, and Burn This Disco Out to the Jackson record, Off the Wall. The uh, intention was for that was to actually have Jackson and Jones select just one song for their record, but they liked his, all of his demos so much that they went with three. So Michael Jackson was only 24 at the time, and he wrote four of the nine songs on Thriller himself. Want to be starting something, which borrows heavily on Sol Marcosa, which I feel like I should splice in now. To the tune of getting sued, right? Did they get sued? Yeah. I, who, I, I mean, taking a shot at Michael Jackson, you better not miss. Wow. Uh, that's who is that? Hugh Masekela? Yeah. I mean, it's the same song. I mean, I, maybe he was arguing that it was sampling before sampling was heavily, you know, had a precedent of, oh, you got to pay these people for this. Oh, no, it was Manu, it was Manu Dibongo, not Hugh Masekela. Oh, I, th I thought it was funny. I thought it was Hugh Masekela, too. Yeah. Um, whoops. We're racist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he sued Jackson and won in 1986, and then he also sued rihanna when she sampled uh, right for please stop the music yeah but yeah i don't think i realized until right this moment that jackson wrote my favorite songs on thriller i want to be starting something the girl is mine <laughs> paul mccartney <laughs> beat it and billy jean and the other songs for thriller were selected by quincy jones and rod temperton in his 2001 autobiography q the autobiography of quincy jones <laughs> God, i love him so much <laughs> yeah. He said, Rod Temperton and I listened to nearly 600 songs before picking out a dozen we liked. And in another interview, he cited this figure as 800. But he's consistently seemed to say that 30 or so of these songs were written by Temperton. That's a hell of a batting average for that songwriter. Good Lord. He said they would all come with like alternate titles and lyrics too. Like he submitted a bunch of different versions of... He was like, well, in case you don't like it with this title and these lyrics, like here's like a three other alternates. So he essentially would write all of these songs like three times. That is wild. And that is what he did with Thriller. Temperman explained to M Magazine that as he got to know Jackson better, he honed in on Michael's love of movies. And that was the prompt that generated Thriller. He said, I came up with the idea that I should write something really theatrical. This is him talking in 2012. I've been really impressed with Michael's participation in the rhythm section when recording Don't Stop Till You Get Enough. So I wanted to write something with the same power, but a really dramatic melody structure. Uh, Michael's love of movies did not extend to horror, however. Uh, Michael described himself as being too scared. And this probably came from uh, when it comes to talking about Michael's trauma. Where else? His father, Joe. <laughs> In uh, what you've described as our second Arrested Development reference on this episode, a hilariously tragic prefiguring of the that's why you don't lie bit from Arrested Development. <laughs> Joe Jackson tried to teach his kids a lesson about leaving their bedroom windows open by climbing through their window one night in a mask and shouting at Michael, which gave him recurring nightmares about being kidnapped. I mean, oh yeah. my God. You, you, it's, it's, you Joe have didn't to even laugh. need a mask. Joe climbing through your window, period, in the middle of the night is scary enough. You have to laugh because otherwise you cry. But like, what an insane person thing to do to your child and largest breadwinner of your family. 
<laughs> to take it to was heart a real so much. Kidnapped. He was so <laughs> mad about about the window being open. And he was like, I will risk, and not risk, but I will permanently damage my son <laughs> and the man who makes enough money for all of us to live. Because he's leaving that damn window open. <laughs> That's I mean, it's kind of it's, it's like sort of the ultimate dad thing to do. Oh yeah, it'd be like if you wanted to teach your kid a lesson about leaving the thermostat on by like faking a house fire or something. Yeah. Like. <laughs> <laughs> kind of shocked he never did that. To be honest, uh, Temperton continued. I remembered messing around with bass patterns and drums until I came up with the core bass line that runs through the piece. Then I started building chords on top to grow the tune to its climax. I wanted it to build and build. A bit like stretching an elastic band throughout the tune to heighten suspense. Actually, I should have put this in from the top. Uh, I guess you can kind of hear that. You're right. It's like... Mm, well, now end. I just want you to sing it. But you got to listen to this. This is a, a bass player named Ian Martin Allison, who does a lot of stuff with a, a site that I... Uh, and social bass, and bass channel, Scott's Bass Lessons. And he does a great bit on this bass line. <laughs> Really, what I'm trying to do is think about this tune in the way that a keys bass player would think about it. But do do go do do go. Short notes, right? Short notes, cut off, muted notes. And it's a great part. So you can actually hear how everyone thinks that bass line is. But it's got that extra little punch, that low one in it. That does make a difference. Yeah. Great, great bass line. Um, the demo was done in Temperton's usually humble circumstances. He said he lived in Germany at the time and he was recording with a two track Revox. So he'd put drums on one track, then play the bass live, bounce back the drums, record that on the other track. Uh, just a lot of self recording and, and bouncing over to a new channel. And he did that with guitars, keys, and vocals. <laughs> that is insane. It really is nuts when you hear the, which we will plug in in a second, the the scrapped version of this before it was Eat Thriller, but like how fully formed it was. Was he like some kind of songwriting virtuoso? I want to know, did he start writing when he was a kid and sell, like, was you he know, like a Tin Pan Alley vet or something? I, I don't know, man. I, I don't really, there's, he did like three interviews in his life and then there's that documentary. Wow. So we don't really know a ton about him. <laughs> he's, he, he's no Quincy Jones. Right. Yes. I mean, just you think about. I I was watching something about a documentary about Ten CC recently, and I didn't realize that one of the guys in it, Glenn Goldman, uh, as like a fourteen, fifteen, sixteen year old, would write these incredible '60s pop hits. Things like um, a lot of Holly songs, like Bus Stop. Mm. No, he started out as a drummer, <laughs> <laughs> then moved to keyboards, and I guess just discovered that he could write really well. Did you know that the guy from 10CC wrote uh, For Your Love and Heart Full of Soul for the Yardbirds? I didn't. Yeah, and a bunch of Holly songs, too. Um, Look Through Any Window, Bus Stop, No Milk Today for Herman's Hermits. That's why they were so good at aping that pop sound, but hmm. with like a weird art school twist, because he got to start as like a 15, 16-year-old writing these pop songs for British pop groups. And I just, yeah, I, I that's weird. I would have thought Temperton had a similar background because he's churning them out single-handedly. Wow. But getting back to Thriller, the song's lyrics and title did not arrive fully formed. And in fact, they went through a few iterations. Temperton told The Telegraph in 2007, originally when I did my Thriller demo, I called it Starlight. That scans really well. Yeah. I can, Totally hear that, yeah. Quincy said to me, you managed to come up with the title for the last album. See what you can do for this album. I said, oh, great. So I went back to the hotel, wrote two or three hundred titles, <laughs> and came up with the title Midnight Man, which kind of rules. <laughs> I like that. I, I don't care what you say. I like it that. It does, but getting back to Arrested Development, it just makes me think of, like, the man in me. <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> you know, like, uh, yeah. That's, Michael that's Michael Jackson, of all people, should not be singing a song called The Midnight, Midnight Man. Midnight Yeah, yeah. Uh, the next morning, this is Temperament continuing, I woke up and I just said this word, thriller. Something in my head just said, this is the title. You could visualize it on the top of the Billboard charts. You could see the merchandising for this one word, how it jumped off the page as thriller. 
So wait, I have a question to you. Did, was Quincy assigning him to basically just write a title for the album? And then once he had Thriller, he realized that it fit the Starlight song? I don't know. Um, and to distract you, <laughs> we're now going to listen to the Starlight demo. Oh, I've never heard this. I'm excited. Because I don't know. This is included on one of the massive Thriller uh, box sets that came out. So it is up on all the streamers. <laughs> Wow, that's that's there. The rubber bands pulling it back. Yeah. I'm leaving it until, until the chorus drops in. I want to hear him say oh, yeah. I don't care if we get sued. <laughs> I kind of like it better. Oh. But I don't like spooky things, so. Yeah, I mean. well, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't have room. I'm not hearing a Vincent Price monologue in there. That's, you know? okay, fair. We're going to take a quick break, but we'll be right back with more Too Much Information in just a moment. I cannot believe they put Thriller together in two months. <laughs> That's the craziest thing. Not the song, the whole album. How long was mixing? Was mixing significantly well, longer? Well, we'll get to mixing. Okay. Uh, recorded by Bruce Swedeen. Swedeen. <laughs> His name is spelled S-W-E-D-I-E-N. Like, so tweet at us. <laughs> if you or a loved one know how to pronounce yeah. Bruce Swedeen's name. Westlake Recording Studios in L.A. $750,000 was the budget, which in today dollars is nearly $2.4 million. Uh, the entire production team worked around the clock. Uh, an interview with the BBC, Quincy Jones said they would carry the second engineers out on stretchers and the musicians, too. <laughs> Bruce and I would stay up for five days, five nights. The passion drives you and the cocaine. Oh, uh, Yeah. Yeah, but the supernatural thing is real too. That was another thing for because Clive was so obsessed with making making supernatural a hit. So they, I think, they were literally working in like twenty four hour shifts on this. When Union Rules said like that guy has to stop mixing your duet with the guy from Everlast, <laughs> and then another guy would come in. It's the Union Steward tapping his wand. Yeah, no more <laughs> Everlast. Stop comping Everlast vocals. Yeah. The guy with the gurney comes in, hauls him out. Puts him in an IV drip. <laughs> He's like, I don't want to go back. Clive, please. Get back there and mix the guy from Everlast's vocals. Cut me, Clive. Was... Cut me. <laughs> cut me. I can't see, Clive. I can't see. <laughs> you got to cut me. <laughs> God, I hate Santana so much. I, uh, he, th this is a question, I mean, because you know a lot more about this stuff than I do. I, I have no concept of what a budget for a big name a list musician album is like like 2.4 million dollars today is that normal for what would like i don't know maroon 5 adele i mean it's definitely interesting it, it's it's an interesting thing that's evolved I, the cost of it has evolved like back in the day if when you were doing this with musicians mo a lot of those fees would be eaten up by just having people cycle in and play uh, okay everything right because like Steely Dan, the classic example for <laughs> Asia, when they were just like calling in every top session guitarist in LA and giving him a crack at one song solo and being like, nope, that wasn't it. Uh, <laughs> you know, those guys were all making scale union fee. And then you have engineers 
at least two, probably more per session, um, a head engineer, a head, you know, producer. Nowadays, that is all probably getting eaten up by like producers and programmers, like, cause everything is done so piecemeal. Um, you would, you know, have a guy who's doing sequencing and programming and then you have like a lot of top people have their preferred vocal engineer so you see the mm -hmm. engineer lists nowadays are so long because it'll be like someone engineered the basic tracking and then someone came in and did taylor or beyonce's vocal or whoever um as far as an average cost i don't know i feel like i've been interviewing you on this episode sorry I just, <laughs> you know a lot more about this than i do uh i mean even just going back like the top google results Invincible, supposedly, is the most expensive record ever made. The last Michael Jack or the sort of basically last Michael Jackson one? Yeah. Yeah. At 30 and 40 million. Jesus Christ. Yeah. I mean, how much of that was hush money? Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, the first out, so this is again just going by Wikipedia. The first album to cost over a million was actually believed to be Tusk. Yeah. Uh, and then it was Guns N' Roses, Chinese Democracy, but that album took, you know, 15 years, 15 yeah. years to make. Yeah. And one of the more recent ones is actually, um, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy by Kanye. And that is, I'm going to go ahead and say due to just hourly studio costs, getting all these different producers in there and having them hit their hourly. Cause he's also on there for Yeezus. Watch the Throne is also on there. <laughs> you know, what's a really surprise one. Ricky Martin. That doesn't surprise me. That era in music in like late 90s. I'm sure there were... That's who's true. Who's the producer on that? I'm sure there was some big name producer that I'm forgetting. Hmm, great question. Oh, Desmond Child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Emilio Estefan. Yeah. And our boy Walter Fantasy, writer of All I Want for Christmas. Yes. That's funny. They put a lot of money behind that record. <laughs> the Darkness's One Way Ticket to Hell and Back is on here. That's so weird. I just referenced The Darkness today, which I do maybe biannually. It's interesting because it, it becomes a thing about like Hollywood accounting too, because it gets right. into promotional costs too. Like when you budget, you know, again, Michael Jackson's history in 1995 is the most expensive marketing campaign ever, uh, supposedly. But, you know, um, something like, like a Virgin is the other thing that's sponsored in or cited in here had a two million campaign from Warner Brothers, but like recently, ten years ago, Born This Way by Lady Gaga cost three million, but apparently that was sponsored by Amazon. So it, it got it, it does come become a really interesting case of accounting where it's like when do you consider the line cut off? Is it like what the label paid? Is it the money that was paid for the studio musicians? Is it money that was paid for mixing and everything? So where were we talking about? How much I hate Santana. Oh yeah, I wanted to know uh, what what your favorite song on Supernatural is. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's take a quick look here. Deep cut, no hits. <sighs> you don't get to I say mean, smooth. Is that the one with Maria Maria on it? Yeah, I might have to go with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, probably. But nothing, nothing will compare with Game of Love, written by. Greg, what's his name? The guy who wrote You Get What You Give by the New Radicals. Oh, Game yeah. of Love is incredible. I was thinking um, of... Uh, damn, there's a song on here with Dave Matthews. Whoa. Love of My Life? Oh, God, I hate Santana. All right. <laughs> Bruce Swid Swideen's parents gave him recording gear for his 10th birthday. By the age of 14, he wasn't only recording everyone, anyone who wanted to swing by. He was also broadcasting his projects on a neighborhood radio station he set up himself. At 19, he was establishing his own commercial studio in Minneapolis. And by 21, he was recording the Chicago Symphony Orchestra professionally for RCA Victor before moving on to Universal the following year. Quite a wunderkin. See, this is what say. I thought Ted Templeton would have had his background, like that kind of like started young and was yeah. just a virtuoso at writing pop hits. It's interesting because Swedeens has Swedeens has kind of a he's got a real mix of high and low culture. Uh, like Michael's vocals on this album are recorded on the same model mic that you and I are both using. That's insane. Wow. Yeah. And a full disclosure for podcast setup, uh, this is like a $350 mic um, as opposed to use like the probably staple for a lot of recordings around this time would have been a Neumann, mm -hmm. um, which are like $3,000 tube mics. So yeah, 
That's that's interesting. Um, do you think it was because he was just built? That's, like he was James yeah, Brown? That's an interesting question. Um, some of what he did... Well, I mean, some of the engineering that he did was actually uh, to get the sound of Michael's dancing involved. Because Michael would dance while he was moving. And so when wow. they, they talked about um, recording... Uh, well, he was on, recording, you mean? Well, he from Bad, singing? this is, yeah, it didn't start on this album, but it actually started on Bad, which I think Sweetie also uh, uh, engineered. But yeah, they would set him up on a drum riser and use a bunch of baffles around it so that his dancing and vocals wouldn't echo, but they would actually use a bunch of like different mics pointed around to get that sound as well as w just one on his voice. But I mean, they also had him do shit, like on Billy Jean, the like, I think it's the, you think twice? Like, one of the backing vocals is him, like, singing through, like, a cardboard, like, a gift like wrap. a toilet paper tube. <laughs> yeah, a gift wrapping tube, because it was, like, long. Um, there's another weird thing that people have always parsed in the liner notes. Uh, it says, recorded and mixed by Bruce Sweden using the uh, Accusonic recording process. And everyone thought it was this, like, weird piece of outboard gear or, like, rack mount gear that... And believe me, there are ex extensive documentations of the rack <laughs> gear that he used on this. If you want to know the exact compressors uh, and EQs used on this, you can find it. But uh, no, this is actually like basically just like an overdub and syncing process uh, without getting too, too much in the weeds. It's like a two-step process. Basically, he would record the rhythm tracks and then lock the master tape away for those uh, and never touch it again until it was time to do a final mix. So every subsequent overdub was done on like a scratch track, uh, uh, a temp, a temp track, a temp comp of all the rhythm tracks so that when they went to do the final mixes, all the rhythm tracks wouldn't have been degraded, uh, by constant oh. overdubs, which as you'll remember from the Bohemian Rhapsody episode, you know, they, they literally overdubbed the tape into transparency. And so Bruce's whole thing was like, well, if you don't want that to happen, you need to keep the original tape as pristine as possible. The other part of it that he would, that this Accusonic thing entails is basically just the other part of the Bohemian Rhapsody thing that we talked about, where you just record a bunch of overdubs, mix them down into a sub mix, bounce that onto a smaller part of the tape. And then you can just, you, he, he was recording on 24 track, uh, but there's way more than 24 tracks on these, uh, because of that process. Uh, and then there's stuff about he, um, the way that he would like sync it up to keep track of all this stuff, but it's really not, it's not like a single piece of gear or anything. Oh, and the, yeah, if you see the drum set that he made for this to get like the isolation of the drum sounds is really funny because he basically like, he took a, uh, uh, the, um, kick drum apart and put like a cinder block in it and like a furniture blanket. So it's this really DIY kind of jury rigged looking thing. And then, uh, he would, um, I think he enclosed or separated the snare and hi-hat with pieces of wood. Like, so he just made all this like custom carpenter style, like really literally built stuff to isolate all the drum sounds and get them as crisp, uh, as sounding as possible. Uh, and this went as far as building a 10 inch drum riser because he, he knew that the low end vibrations from the kick drum and the, uh, low toms could bleed into the walls and floor and affect the resonant frequencies of the room. So yeah, that guy's a nerd. Um, <laughs> But I'm shocked argue. that there wasn't it wasn't all uh, electronic drums. I think I just sort of assumed they were drum machines. I think it's a little early. I mean, there is uh, Michael's true. credited with using the Lin drum on this, which is like one of the first ones, uh, Roger Lin's drum, and and that's in particular for a lot of Prince stuff. But I think at this point in the '80s, they would have been using it for like hits more than actual mm. full tracks. Um, do you know that the Lin drum is samples of the Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers drummer? No. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> so I f***ed it up, actually. The LM1 is mostly samples from Ronnie Wood's brother, Art Wood, and then the clap sounds come from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. <laughs> so when you hear that early uh, LM1, let's see if I can find it, actually. There, there was. <laughs> is that that's is supposedly that that, supposedly the Tom Petty from the Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers sessions? Is that the sound that opens Uptown Funk? Probably a little weasel. <laughs> oh, I like Mark Ronson. Yeah, you would.
<laughs> oh, I meant Bruno Mars. I have no, I have uh, no problem. I have no quarrel with Mark Ronson. Uh, oh yeah. So you know we've talked about this this wild uh, Prince Michael Jackson rivalry, a multifaceted, oh, yeah. long, decades long thing. But one of the funniest influences on uh, Thriller is specifically from Prince's 1999. And w- let me backtrack a little bit. Filling out the ranks of the people who played on Thriller is a group of known Quincy Jones collaborators: Greg Fillingains on synths, Rhodes, David Williams on guitar, uh, guys Jerry Hay, Car- Gary Grant, so close to Cary Grant. Larry Williams and Bill Reichenbach on various horns. Uh, Brian Banks, who also played synths, told The Telegraph, it was late in the evening one night, which is so close to Monster Mash. I don't know if he knew that he was doing that. It would have been amazing if in this interview, Brian Banks was like, we were working in the lab late one night. Uh, So he said, it was late in the evening one night when we were working, and Quincy came to us. He wanted this huge chord sequence. He said, there's this sound I've got in my head. There's this underground, this new artist that nobody's ever really heard of, but he's great. He's hot. He's got this great song. And he pulled out the album, and it was 1999 by Prince. And so, he says, you know that opening sound on 1999? That was the sound that he wanted, but bigger, that Quincy Jones wanted for Thriller. So let's take a listen to that. stuff that goes into the thriller as well which we will now let's get into that before we get to uh get into the rest of the song jordan take it away talking to music radar bruce swedeen the engineer explained that the wolf howls were rod temperton's idea he said at the time there was a sherlock holmes movie the hound of the baskervilles and they had this huge dog a great dane in it that did some howling and of course i had that in my mind's ear my mind's ear i like that (laughs) I automatically thought of my great Dan, who I figured ought to be in show business. So I tried to get him to do those howls, and you know what? He never did it. We put him up in the barn at night to listen to the coyotes, and I had my tape machine ready to record him. He was a fantastic dog, 200 pounds. His name was Max. But you know who it is doing those wolf howls? That's Michael Jackson. We had to get Michael to do it instead, but he did so great. There's some library stuff in there, but Michael did those lone wolf howls. I had no idea. That's that's very good. I'm also obliged to mention at this point that Brian Wilson of my beloved Beach Boys got his dogs, Louie and Banana, to bark in the studio for the end of Caroline No on one of my favorite albums of all time, Pet Sounds. They were champs, unlike what was the guy's great unlike game, this, Max. Unlike, unlike Max, this punk-ass this putz, dog. This putz. Yes. Get me the dogs from Pet Sounds. <laughs> I don't care how much it costs. <laughs> Michael's underwriting this whole thing. <laughs> Bring me the dogs. What is it? What are their names? Uh, Louie and Banana. Bring me Louie and Banana. <laughs> Put it on Quincy's bill. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most organic use of the cigar uh, chopping executive that we've had in a long time. <laughs> he's got to come it back. It was feeling you know, forced for a while, here. but that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce Swedeen continued. For the creaking doors, I went to Universal Studios in Hollywood, the movie lot, and rented two or three sound effects doors and brought them to Westlake and spent a whole day auditioning these doors <laughs> and miking the hinges real close. God, the 80s record industry had more money Hell than yeah. it knew what to do with. <laughs> I spent the day checking out these doors. That was a real door I recorded, and I added it onto the track. Come to think of it, that might have been Michael doing those footsteps, too, actually. God, I love it. There's a- what a talent. <laughs> Is there anything he couldn't do? <laughs> Lastly, we've got to talk about Vincent Price, baby. Bisexual icon who once taught Johnny Carson how to cook fish in a dishwasher. You could have made all of that up for all I know. They think they think he might have been bisexual. Well, I meant more of the... I, I was more referring to the cooking fish in a dishwasher. What's that about? Oh, well, great question. Vincent Price was a big fan of a big cooking guy and among his many culinary endeavors was simple, easy ways to, uh, 
Cook. And when he was on Carson, and he, uh, pulling the clip up now. This might be the most clip-rich episode we've ever done. Yeah, well, you know, you gotta pull out Vincent doing the dishwasher. Now, you yeah. put this in the oven? You don't no. put it in the oven. No, you don't. No, and I'll tell you what you do put it in. Such a distinctive voice. Here it is. It's Truman the Capote. The dishwasher. True. Actually, Truly. absolutely true. Now, I give you my word that an hour before the show started, it's true. we cooked exactly that meal in this dishwasher on the full cycle, mind you. Now, on the full cycle. The water and... Uh... Everything. Yeah, no rinse. No rinse. No, and no soap. But the drying and but all But everything, the whole bit. Now, here it all is. There are our dishes. And they're hot. Now, they're hot. And we hope they're done. And I'm sure they are done because we've tried it and it was successful. And we'll take a look first at the... Why, why do you use a dishwasher? Just to... Uh... Because it steams and it heats. And fish is one of the few things. You couldn't do, you know, meat or anything well, like I that see. in it. So but the... fish cooks in only a very short time. And it really is kind of beautiful. Because it steams and it heats. <laughs> That's incre- That's a great household tip that... Did not make it to TikTok yet. <laughs> yeah, right. Wait till they get a load of Vincent Price's dishwasher salmon. Uh, <laughs> Temperton said in an interview included on the CD reissue of Thriller, I had always envisioned a talking section at the end, but I didn't really know what to do with it. It turns out that Quincy Jones' wife, then wife, doesn't he have like seven wives? Yeah. Quincy like Jones' that. wife of the moment, Peggy Lipton, <laughs> at the time best known as Julie from the Mod Squad, but now beloved as Norma from Twin Peaks, knew the legendary horror actor, Vincent Price. Funnily enough, the 2017 biography of Temperton, The Invisible Man, by Jed Pittman, contended that Temperton's original choice for the voiceover was Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. But her image was probably a little too sexy for uh, prudish little Mikey. Uh, Temperton later said the idea was that Price would just talk some whore talk like he would deliver in his famous roles. The night before our session, Quincy called and said, I'm a bit scared. Perhaps you better write something for him. So Temperton wrote one verse of that talking part uh, while waiting for a taxi to the studio and then two more verses during the ride. Uh, Vincent apparently recorded this in two takes. And we have here a bit of studio banter from that recording session. And if you ever wanted to hear two men who sound like old women, here it is. Listen to this show. (laughs) Okay, tape's rolling. Anytime you want Hi, this is Michael Jackson. This is Vincent Price. Although you can hear how his voice drops Michael like an octave when he's doing the Vincent Price voice. The thriller. <laughs> Do we both say it? Say it together. It's, it's in my ears. It's, it's in my headphones. All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anytime, test okay. Hi, this is Michael Jackson. And this is Vincent Price inviting you to the, the thriller. thriller. Darkness falls across the land. The midnight hour is close at hand. Creatures crawl in search of blood to terrorize your neighborhood. And whosoever shall be found without the soul for getting down. Incredible. Did he rhyme blood with hood? He sure did. He also okay. said y'all, cool. which is very funny. Oh. Yeah. To terrorize y'all's neighborhood. Was there visuals with that, or was it just no. Uh, audio? No. Uh, it is a photoshopped image of uh, Vincent Price holding Michael Jackson's head. <laughs> Severed? <laughs> uh, Temperton elaborated to M Magazine, I told the driver to drive around back to the studio, and I raced in and told the secretary to photocopy what I'd written, and was able to walk into the studio and calmly hand the copy to Vincent, who recorded it in two takes. He was just fantastic. Wow, so he didn't have that the night before and, like, prepped it. Man's a pro. That's nuts. That's what you get making 17 movies a year with Roger Corman. (laughs) Yeah, true. (laughs) Uh, According to Sonic Fantasy, a documentary about engineer Bruce Swedeen, Vincent Price had never used headphones before and was startled when he put them on to record and Thriller blared out. Now, I, I, I find that hard to believe. I mean, I, I don't know, man. I, I don't know what his... Did he record a Calypso album like everybody else was doing in the, <laughs> in the 60s? <laughs> I mean, maybe during his like radio days or whatever, but like... Well, yeah, he was I guess old, you're so. right. I guess, I, I guess that doesn't seem to track because... <laughs> He was nominated for a Grammy 
No way. For what? His voice work in the 1959 album Great American Speeches. Huh. <laughs> He read uh, On the War of 1812 by Henry Clay, The Crime Against Kansas by Charles Sumner, for which he was nominated for a Grammy Award. Anyway, I don't know. That's just what that's just what the documentary said. So sue me. But as you alluded to earlier, uh, Vincent Price recorded more than what's heard on the final track of Thriller, and he only performed the monologue live on TV once during an episode of The Tonight Show, hosted by Joan Rivers, I guess she was the guest host, Mm -hmm. back in 1987. Yeah, and he was offered a flat fee for his work on the track, or a cut of the profits, and he chose poorly. Uh, The figure that I keep seeing is 20 grand, uh, which, not bad for a couple hours' work, but, you know, when you later find out that this is the most, the highest selling record of all time, um, it did indeed rankle price uh, after the song became a hit. John Landis, who directed the Thriller video, told The Telegraph, Vincent called me about a year later and said, look, the kid made the most successful record of all time, and I made less than $1,000. Michael won't take my calls. I'm very upset about it. Let me see if I can do that in his voice. Vincent called me about a year later, and he said, look, the kid made the most successful record of all time, and I made less than $1,000. Michael won't take my calls. I'm very upset about it. (laughs) It's very stewy. Yeah, I didn't, yeah. Strike that. Uh, in Price's <laughs> daughter's Price's daughter Victoria wrote a biography of her dad, uh, and in, in it she wrote, "Word eventually trickled back to Michael Jackson that my father was upset about the money. One day I answered the door at my father's house to find three members of Jackson's entourage. They came bearing a gift, a letter of thanks from Jackson, and a large frame containing a poster of the pop star and one gold and two platinum albums, all dedicated to Vincent." Was the poster to... not even autographed? <laughs> Needless to say, this framed wall art, coming from one of the richest art people in the world, did not mollify Price. He attempted to get paid for the usage of his voice in the music video, but there was a clause in his contract about video rights that was buried in it, so he didn't get any further money from that either. And at that point, Victoria wrote, Vincent agitated to have the gold disc auctioned, with the proceeds to go to his gallery at East Los Angeles College. She continued in a truly stunning postscript that when news of Jackson's multi-million dollar settlement to one of his alleged victims was made public, Vincent Price quipped, all I can say is Michael Jackson f***ed me, and I didn't get paid for it. Stunning line reading there, too. That was good. (laughs) As you meditate on that, we'll be right back with more Too Much Information after these messages. Uh, we will spare you from the torturous details of post-production on Thriller, but one illustrative antidote is that Bruce Swedeen did 91 f***ing mixes of Billy Jean. <laughs> 91 separate mixes. Guess which one they used. <laughs> Number two. <laughs> <sighs> also complicating matters was that they had actually too much music. Uh, which is an interesting uh, 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 archival, or no, what's the word I want to use? Archival. Old-timey? <laughs> antiquated? Antiquated. An antiquated concern from, God, I'm getting old. An antiquated <laughs> concern from the vinyl pressing days. Um, the more music that you have on a disc, the thinner the grooves have to be. And thinner grooves do not transmit lower frequencies as well. You need wide deep grooves for that and Quincy Jones obviously thinking with the mind that this was going to be a hit pop dance record wanted thinner deeper grooves so they actually had to cut stuff out of this they cut down uh, the intro to Billie Jean and they cut a verse from the lady in my life I didn't realize that wow yeah a lot of um, there were problems on I think mixing some early Beatles singles where the bass when it went too low would cause the record to the needle to jump out of the groove I thought it was the distortion I thought it was when they they, they made the they pushed the distortion on those too much I think it was both I, yeah. you know, sometimes it was the, the lower bass stuff or things like paperback writer but that's interesting that also plays into the sequencing that they would do on the, on records from this era where they would have the so your side right. one track one is your banger because that's going to have the deepest bass response and everything and then the grooves get thinner as it goes towards the center so that's why traditionally in these big classic rock albums the end of 
uh, both sides is like a smaller acoustic number or like something that doesn't have to hit that. as hard. I did. I just thought that was a, a show busy thing. Although I'm I guess so- if you're going to have an intermission, like on the ending of a side or yeah. ending of an album, I guess that sounds like you want to end with something huge anyway. So that's interesting. Wow. Uh, speaking of interesting things, despite the heavy marketing push behind Thriller, the brain trust behind that push which was Michael Jackson, his lawyer and very close advisor, John Branca, and CBS Records Chief Walter Yetnikoff, and Epic Head of Promotion Frank DeLeo, did not include plans for a third video, and certainly not a video of the title track, which wasn't even going to be released as a single. No, Thriller was not going to be released as a single. To which I say, good. My sixth favorite track on the album. <laughs> They should have made wants- another video for The Girl Is Mine. <laughs> yeah, yes. A focus more on Paul. <laughs> uh, Walter Yetnikoff, the head of CBS Records, told Vanity Fair, who wants a single about monsters? That was a prevailing <laughs> thought. 17 billion Americans can't be wrong. Bobby Boris Pickett also. Uh, this despite the fact that Jackson was batting a thousand at this point after the videos for Billie Jean and Beat It. Uh, part of the success of those videos was Yetnikov threatening to pull CBS and Columbia's acts from MTV's rotation unless they played Michael's videos. At the time, MTV had a no black acts policy, which I'm sure was not <laughs> written in such stark. I mean, I, I, I was an unwritten rule, I would imagine. Yeah, you remember there's that clip of David Bowie pushing Bowie, yeah. someone on, on, on air. Um, Mark right. Goodman. He's a friend of mine now. I like Mark Goodman. Well, yeah. sucks to be I him. Know, I know. I felt bad for him when I saw that clip resurface recently and realized it was him. Uh, but yeah, MTV had this uh, unspoken but strictly enforced no black acts policy at this time. Buzz Brindle, MTV's former director of music programming, told Jet Magazine in 2006, MTV was originally designed to be a rock music channel. It was difficult for MTV to find African American artists whose music fit the channel's format that leaned towards rock at the outset. Hmm. Hmm. Sounds like a weak excuse. Although, you know, Les Garland, who isn't the uh, network's co-founder, also talked to Jet. He said, we just had nothing to pick from. 50% of my time was spent in the early days of MTV convincing artists to make music videos and then convincing record labels to put up money to make those videos. That's interesting. I, Hmm. I buy that. I'm sure, like, convincing people to spend money on music videos was an uphill battle. I could have sworn there was another famous example of somebody, of a very famous artist. Maybe it was, maybe it was Michael. Oh, Rick James? Mm, Not who I was thinking of, but... Yeah, Rick had to battle Motown for money uh, to make videos for Give It To Me Baby and Super Freak. Actually, and funny enough, the director of those, Nick Saxton, did Can't Stop Till You Get Enough. Oh, wow. That's a really groundbreaking video. With the bubbles and stuff in the background. I I guess it was green screened, but I'm sure at the time it was... Wow, this is actually really fascinating. Uh, This is on Lit Hub um, by Raymond Hervey II. Uh, he basically, the long and short of this is that there was a Billboard music video conference held in New York, uh, and Gail Sparrow, who's a vice president of MTV, who you may remember from our Osborne's episode, I want to say, or Cribs, that name rings a bell. Uh, Nuppy Baby got back. Yeah. Uh, so this guy, uh, Raymond Hervey II proposed that Rick James fill the artist slot on this panel. And he said the panel discussion was well attended. When it came time for Rick to speak, he started out on point, but within a few minutes went off script and pointedly attacked MTV's programming format for being discriminatory and racially biased. He took the exact stance we had told him to avoid, and his (laughs) comments created a media firestorm contrary to my vision. (laughs) Yeah, this this is an interesting side tangent that I did not know anything about. Um, This made it as far as the LA Times. Rick did an interview with the LA Times. He accused MTV of being racist. Ooh, Rob Tannenbaum and Cred Marks in I Want My MTV, the uncensored story of the music video revolution, said that MTV's lone black executive, Carolyn Baker, took credit for rejecting Rick's Super Freak video. (laughs) She said it wasn't MTV that turned down Super Freak. It was me. I turned it down. You know why? Because there were half-naked women in it, and it was a piece of crap. As a black woman, I did not want that representing my people as the first black video on MTV. Far out. Hmm. No. Where were we? <laughs> uh, I think we were about to tell us about another factor in the Thriller video's conception. 
Oh, sure. Well, another factor in the Thriller video's conception <laughs> was that in June 1983, the album, after four months at number one on the Billboard 200 chart, was bumped from the top slot by the Flashdance soundtrack. It briefly oh, wow. crawled back atop the chart in July before him being bumped again by the police's synchronicity. So the three remaining singles from the record, Wanna Be Starting Something, released in May, Human Nature, scheduled for July, and PYT, Pretty Young Thing, for September, were not ex- pretty young thing. We're not expected to drive album sales as much as Billie Jean or Beat It had, and we're not pegged as good material for videos. Uh, but the for the extremely competitive MJ, who is obsessed with beating his peers like Prince and Madonna, and his constant uh, yardstick by which he measured his own success, the Beatles, this was cause for alarm. Walter Yetnikoff uh, and Larry Stessel, Epic's West Coast marketing executive told Vanity Fair that they started getting calls in the middle of the night from Michael Jackson. Walter, the record isn't at number one anymore. What are we going to do about it? Walter Yetnikoff recalled. He said, we're going to go to sleep and deal with it tomorrow. And it was uh, Epic head of promotion Frank DeLeo who first mentioned the idea of making a third video and pressed Jackson to consider the album's title track. I work with people like that. That sucks. <laughs> Somehow, despite not really being a horror aficionado, Michael had seen An American Werewolf in London, John Landis's groundbreaking horror comedy that featured Oscar-winning makeup SFX icon Rick Baker. Baker. I shouldn't take this. He's a hero of yours. You take this. Oh, I do love Rick Baker. Uh, <laughs> what else did we talk about him? We talked about him in one episode. Uh, the Thing. Yes. So, John Landis uh, also did, you know, Blues Brothers, killed some kids. Um, has a really <laughs> oh. fail son. Did he kill the kids or was it just a stunt man who died? I think it was both. Yeah. So that's the Twilight Zone movie. Um, but you know, he also did Blues Brothers. So got to break a few eggs. <laughs> <laughs> Landis told the Telegraph Michael contacted me and asked me if I would make a video with him. And I said, no, actually, because they were basically commercials, right? But he persisted and he said, no, 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 I really want to make it. So when I returned to L.A., I called Rick Baker, who had done the makeup effects for American Werewolf, and said, Rick, Michael Jackson wants to become a monster. It's funny because when Landis and Jackson met for the first time, uh, Landis was talking to Vanity Fair. They did a great oral history of the video. John Landis apparently teased Michael Jackson when he asked him about seeing American Werewolf in London. He said, Michael, what about the sex? And Jackson said, I close my eyes. <laughs> Another funny anecdote, according to Quincy Jones' autobiography, when they were recording Thriller or Beat It, one of them, <laughs> in, in Quincy Jones' word, a healthy California girl walked by the front window of the studio, God, which was a one-way mirror facing a street, and pulled her dress up over her head. She was wearing absolutely nothing underneath. Uh, and Michael Jackson ducked behind the mixing console so that he wouldn't look, while Quincy Jones and all the <laughs> studio musicians ogled this woman. This woman who, for whatever reason, just decided to flash a mirror, I guess. You know, I don't know. LA's weird. <laughs> <laughs> the funniest thing that my my father has ever seen, and I hope he's listening right now so that he can he can have a good laugh at this. It was at, I think it was at a Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum. And they had a mirror and they had like a plaque in front of it that was talking about like, you know, only one in 10 people can like do the cloverleaf thing with their, with their tongue. And like only one in four can like roll your tongue into like a tube that goes straight up and down. And only one in eight can do it to facing the left and right. Anyway, you're, and you're in front of this mirror and you're making all these, like you're testing this out with your tongue and doing all these goofy things with your lips and everything. And then you go through the entire museum. It's like all one track and it takes like an hour to get through. And at the very end, you just go, there's a big window with a sign over that says monkey house. And you realize that that mirror with the tongue stuff was a one way mirror. And you're just watching people <laughs> just like make stupid faces in the, in the window. And my dad thought that was the funniest thing he'd ever seen. <laughs> Ah, friend of the pod. Big dick Dick run dog. Yes. <laughs> John Landis told Michael Jackson that he didn't want to direct a music video and instead wanted to think of the production as an actual short film shot on 35 millimeter with multiple locations, a show stopping dance number, as you wrote, and Ted Baker's makeup. Not Ted Baker, Rick Baker. <laughs> Ted Baker does Ted clothes. Baker. It's a clothing brand. <laughs> it's a. <laughs> <laughs> That's more my speed. Yeah. And Landis's budget for this short film, $900,000, or nearly $2.9 million today. <laughs> Landis recalled that when Michael called CBS head Walter Yetnikoff with that figure, 
after CBS had already dropped a quarter million dollars for Beat It, Yetnikov screamed so loudly that the director had to literally hold the phone away from his ear, a move I've only seen in cartoons, really. (laughs) Steam coming off. I was going to say, there's like air coming out of the phone, (laughs) blowing Landis's hair to the side. Uh, When Landis hung up the phone, Jackson said calmly, it's okay, I'll pay for it. It's okay, I'll pay for it. (laughs) My, 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 my MJ's getting there. I'm going to start calling I, you in the middle of the night. <laughs> doing, I need practice. Doing weird MJ monologues. <laughs> Jordan, do you ever think, do you believe in an afterlife? <laughs> okay, we'll talk in the morning. <laughs> just thinking about you. <laughs> We're just doing like, so- what else? I just do Werner Herzog monologues. <laughs> Hang on. Let me see if I can find my favorite one. This is, uh, Werner Herzog's monologue from uh, Burden of Dreams, Les Blank documentary. Um, oh, Les Blank, yeah. Yeah, yeah, about the making of uh, Fitzcarraldo. Kinski always says it's full of erotic elements. I don't see it so much erotic. I see it more <laughs> full of obscenity. Nature here is vile and base. I wouldn't see anything erotical here. I see fornication and asphyxiation and choking and fighting. Of course, there's a lot of misery. But it is the same misery that is all around us. The trees here are in misery, and the birds are in misery. I don't think they sing. They just screech in pain. (laughs) That goes on. I'm going to do the end of seven. (laughs) Ernest Hemingway once wrote, The world's a fine place and worth fighting for. I agree with the second part. (laughs) I don't know why that was the one I came up with. Uh, Where the hell are we? (laughs) Oh, so Landis hung up the phone after being yelled at by the head of CBS for asking for a $900,000 budget. Michael Jackson said calmly, I can't do it in his voice. It's okay. I'll pay for it. CBS ultimately spent another $100,000 towards the video, which still left a huge shortfall. So they came up with a unique solution. They decided to film the behind the scenes on 16 millimeter for a nearly 45 minute documentary called Making Michael Jackson's Thriller, which bundled with the thriller video could be sold to cable for a hour special. What the the video itself is 13, 14 Mm -hmm. minutes, 45 minute special. You got a full hour. Great. MTV agreed to pay 250,000 and Showtime agreed to pay 300,000 for the one hour package. Jackson would cover the assorted costs up front and be reimbursed by them. And then also Vestron came in. I don't know what Vestron is and offered to distribute making Michael Jackson's thriller as a $29.95 sell through video on VHS and Betamax, which was a pioneering deal of its kind. Uh, What is Vestron? I imagine it's just a distribution company. Yeah, Something like that. Uh, You have another story from Landis. (laughs) I do. Uh, I don't know how much he's full of But he told the Telegraph that a part of the costs were that he insisted that this would be a union shoot, um, which most music videos at the time weren't, and that the team of dancers that he assembled be given two weeks to rehearse. So, make of that what you will. Uh, The plot of the film is, uh, and Michael's sort of look is loosely based on I Was a Teenage Werewolf, which is Michael Landon. Is that Michael Landon? Yeah, I think. Um, there's a nod to a boatload of other horror movies in there. Um, and they needed a love interest for Jackson and they landed on Ola Ray, a former Playboy playmate, which obviously caused some consternation from Jackson. And just told Vanity Fair, I auditioned a lot of girls and this girl, Ola Ray, first of all, she was crazy for Michael. She had such a great smile. I didn't know she was a playmate. I said, Michael, she's a playmate, but so what? She's not a playmate in this. Uh, Ola Ray and Michael Jackson got on well. Um, she told Vanity Fair that she had a hilarious exchange with Jackson's makeup artist. Michael Jackson would watch her do her makeup and wanted to get tips from her for his makeup artist. Uh, he said, I have this shine on my nose that I can't get off. And then when Ray tried talking to Michael Jackson's makeup artist, that person responded to her, don't you know that how much powder I put on his nose, it's going to shine? Do you know how many nose jobs he's had? <laughs> Uh, And this is news to me. The pair even had something of a real-life romance, or at least as close as you could get to it with a heavily traumatized Michael Jackson, uh, on the set of the video. Um, Ray described this to Vanity Fair thusly. I won't say that I have seen him in his birthday suit, but close enough. Kissing and puppy love makeout sessions, and a little bit more than that. Gross. (laughs) 
Uh, <laughs> she actually sounds really like down bad for Michael Jackson after, year, after years for this. Like she just talks about how head over heels she was for him. Everyone remarks on their chemistry. And there's a really heartbreaking quote in Vanity Fair where she's like, she says something to the effect of like, I just wish uh, I had been allowed in Michael's life more because I feel like I could have helped him. Oh, wow. Which is just Aww. so crushing. Yeah. Um, she also appeared on Cheers and in Beverly Hills Cop 2, but her only other notable music video was Give Me the Night by George Benson, a single also written by Rod Temperton and produced by Quincy Jones. Isn't that funny? I love that little connection. Uh, she and Jackson did not have a happy ending. Uh, she sued him in 2009 for non-payment of royalties, saying, I got the fame from Thriller, but I didn't get the fortune. This was surely the worst thing to happen to Michael Jackson in 2009. <laughs> hey -o, I want to say. <laughs> hey <-o. laughs> Oh, boy. Uh, Jordan, why don't you take this next chunk? Okay. Makeup artist Rick Baker told The Telegraph, I got a call from John Landis, and he was like, you know who Michael Jackson is? And I was like, yeah, kind of. He's the guy from the Jackson 5, right? And he said, well, he's got this song called Thriller, and he wants to do a short film. And I said, I didn't want to do it. It's not the most popular job, being a makeup artist. It's like being a dentist in a way. <laughs> they have to sit in a chair for hours while you work on them. It's uncomfortable. It's not something actors look forward to. Uh, Becker continued, you start with the casting of the actor's face, then the latex, the contact lenses. Michael's makeup started more as a werewolf and then became more cat-like. We made <laughs> He elaborated on this, uh, Rick Baker did, to Vulture in 2010. We made him into more of a were-cat, <laughs> which I didn't, I wasn't aware was a thing. I've uh, always thought that was the weirdest thing, where I'm like, you, what? <laughs> we we were -cat? made him into more of a were-cat, just because I didn't want to do another werewolf, I guess, because he'd just done an uh, American Werewolf in London with John Landis. At first, I was thinking it would be almost like a Black Panther thing, but I ended up putting a longer mane of hair on Michael and bigger ears. Uh, you've also read that the were-cat approach was also because of Jackson's... Well, <laughs> so they said, they said uh, because of Michael's delicate features... And I didn't parse it any more than that, but there's obviously two ways that that phrasing could be interpreted. And I think one of them is that his nose was simply structurally too delicate to support uh, the larger muzzle prosthetic that a so werewolf. So fine features, just a, yes. a literally delicate nose. Okay. That's what I, that's what I, that's just, just a tinfoil hat shit on my, on my end. But, you know, I have my theories because it's a really dumb looking werecat. I'm yeah, sorry. It's so yeah. bad looking. Uh, the zombie dancers were also subjected to a makeup routine. Uh, Michelle Simmons, one of the dancers, told the Telegraph, they took most of our teeth for the dentures that they put in our mouths. You put those in your mouth, and now you can't close your mouth. And when you can't close your mouth, the saliva falls out. Ew. And they just said, this is great. Let's just put some food color and dye in there and make it really nasty looking. That was part of the deal. That's so gross. It is. Another dancer, Lorraine Fields, recalled, I remember at one point they got some dirt on the floor and stuck it on my face <laughs> and said, this looks good. Yeah, Baker said in a, he was frustrated because ordinarily they would have done individual casts of every every dancer's face uh, for it. And instead, they weren't given that much time. And so they instead just kind of made three, like, rough prosthetics that were kind of like a like small, medium, and large size and, and just slapped <laughs> them on everyone. So, uh, uh, Jackson's iconic wardrobe in the video was the work of Deborah Landis, John Landis' wife, uh, who you will perhaps recall from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, yeah. Um, long, iconic Hollywood wardrobe designer. Uh, since the video would be shot at night with a relatively subdued palette, she told Vanity Fair, I felt that red would really pop in front of the ghouls. <laughs> I just find that word so inherently comedic. You know, in front of the ghouls. Uh, and so she elected to make both his jacket and jeans red to make Jackson appear taller. The shoulders of that jacket gave him some virility, she told the Telegraph. Phrasing. Uh, <laughs> the, sock, the socks and shoes were his own. He took that directly from Fred Astaire, who always wore soft leather loafers to dance in, and socks. Uh, one of those jackets that Jackson wore for the video was sold to a Texan gold trader named Milton Verrett. Thomas Pynchon ass name and character. <laughs> In 2011, for 1.8 million. You gotta ask, I mean, do these people just, like, 
put that on? I mean, I, I can't imagine a, <laughs> I, a Texas I mean, gold trader would dude, fit in the Michael Jackson's filler jacket, but like... You know he puts it on and does the dance. I mean, like risky business style, just like slides yes. around his living room yes. in the thriller jacket. Yes. I think I saw one of the like B thriller jackets in the, uh, in the hard rock vault in mm. Orlando that I toured a bunch of years ago, which is one of the most surreal things I've ever done. It's like a BJ's Sam's Club size warehouse in the Orlando Everglades and you walk in and it's just, you know, uh, uh, oh, first of all, one of the entire walls is just completely filled with guitars that go all the way yeah. up to the ceiling. It's gargantuan mm -hmm. and they just have rows upon rows upon rows. It looks like a prop warehouse but it's just everything is like oh this is from the u2 uh pop tour this is from lady gaga's monster ball this is anything uh anything good though <sighs> a, a lot of the good stuff i think was in more climate controlled stuff i'm trying to uh, give me a second i actually nah, i don't care no like, no nah, i gotta care. eat dinner keep going <laughs> i truly don't give a shit about the hard rock vault i think you you need to understand that my friend <laughs> the iconic choreography in the video came about in conjunction with Beat It choreographer Michael Peters. Jackson said, it was a delicate thing to work on. I remember my original approach was, how do you make zombies and monsters dance without it being comical? This is Michael talking to MTV News in 1999. So I said, we have to do just the right kind of movement so it doesn't become something that you laugh at. But it just has to take it to another level. I got in a room with choreographer Michael Peters, and he and I together kind of imagined how these zombies move by making faces in the mirror. Second reference to making faces in mirrors in this episode. I used to come to rehearsal sometimes with monster makeup on, and I loved, and I loved doing that. So he and I collaborated, and we both choreographed the piece, and I thought it should go into this jazzy kind of step. You know, kind of gruesome things like that. Uh, yeah. Michelle Simmons, one of the dancers, told The Telegraph that the rehearsals were held in Debbie Reynolds' dance studio in North Hollywood. That's amazing. Speaking of buying stuff, uh, one of the largest <laughs> Hollywood memorabilia collections in history. That's true. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, in uh, the making of Thriller, the making of video that accompanied this, uh, Peters, the choreographer, Michael Peters, the choreographer, talks about Jackson's physical facility with these steps. He said, Michael danced in front of 18 professionals who spent their lives training to achieve what Jackson picked up in minutes. He said, purely on rhythm, he works. I give him the rhythm of a step and he does it. You say, this is the beat, you know, dum -da 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 -da, and he does it. It's really wonderful to watch because it's an innate gift. He's a dancer in his soul. The thriller dance has become so beloved that, uh, you remember that when they were going around in the early web 2.0 days, you know, I remember everyone's the members, the guy, the prison version. <laughs> oh, the, the prison thriller. Oh my God. I forgot about that. I haven't thought about that yeah. in years. And then, but did you know that the world record for the most people doing the thriller dance at once was achieved by 13,597 participants in Mexico City in August of 2009? I did not. I assume this was in tribute to the then recently departed King of Pop. It was. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to set you up. <laughs> The thriller shoots took place at the Palace Theater in downtown Los Angeles. The zombie sequence at the junction of Union Pacific Avenue and South Calzona Street in East Los Angeles. And the final house scene at 1345 Carroll Avenue in the Angelino Heights neighborhood of Echo Park. Marty Thomas, the video's props assistant, recalled the atmosphere around the shoot to the Telegraph. I remember we had to sign a non-disclosure agreement, not to tell anyone what we were filming, not to tell family or anything. What they would do is print out maps to the location and leave them around, but they were false locations. Somebody from the press would sneak on set and steal these maps, and they were just sort of locations of the shopping mall that's closed, way, way out in the valley. He continued, We couldn't believe this was for just one music video. It was a small city everywhere we went. There was a lot of police, a lot of security. And John Landis, he would let people who made it there get pretty close, but behind a barrier. They had third and fourth and fifth assistant directors handling the crowd, which would be in numbers of two, three to four hundred who had figured out where to go or had heard from one of the film crew or ever. They are watching on the set. 
Filming, unfortunately, was occasionally marred by Jackson's eccentricities, we'll call them. One telling detail on Vanity Fair's profile of the shoot had him showing up 45 minutes late to a makeup session, infuriating John Landis, the director, and returning from a bathroom break carrying his boa constrictor, called Muscles, in a (laughs) pillowcase, which he then proceeded to drape around the neck of a reporter. The shoot was also marked by a series of high-profile visitors. We got Rock Hudson, Fred Astaire, which must have really made Michael happy, Jackie Kennedy Onassis, who would later edit Michael Jackson's Moonwalk autobiography. I didn't realize that. Uh, Another Hollywood heavy, uh, in your parentheticals, (laughs) pun intended, visiting was Marlon Brando, who was giving Jackson acting advice. One day, when Landis chastised Jackson for flubbing his lines, Jackson said, Marlon told me... (laughs) I can't do it. Marlon Marlon. told me to always go for the truth, not the words. Other, less fun visitors included Michael's parents, Joseph and Catherine Jackson, which caused a minor stir. Landis told Vanity Fair, Michael asked me to have Joe removed. He said, will you please ask my father to leave? So I go over to Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson, I'm sorry, but can you please... Who are you? I'm John Landis. I'm directing this. Well, I'm Joe Jackson. I do what I please. (laughs) I said, I'll have to ask security to remove you if you don't leave now. John just told the magazine that he had a policeman escort Joe Jackson off the set, which Jackson, through his lawyer, denied in the piece. (laughs) Damn. Oi. As the project moved out of shooting and into the editing stage, with a slated premiere date at the Crest Theater in Westwood of November 14th, 1983, Jackson's religious beliefs nearly derailed the entire thing when he called his lawyer, John Bronca, and ordered him to destroy the negative of Thriller two weeks before the premiere. Uh, This is just for the making of video. This is funny. Landis added up all the footage that they shot and realized that they were at 26 minutes rather than the half hour they were aiming for. So he dug through Jackson's closet for the old 8mm home videos that you see in there to pad out the running time. (laughs) Anyway, uh, Michael Jackson had... Uh, eventually divulged on the phone to Branca that the Jehovah's Witnesses, and at this time Jackson was a devout practitioner, he would go door-to-door proselytizing as the religion demands, wearing a fake mustache. I'm not making (laughs) that up. Anyway, the Jehovah's Witness had gotten wind of Thriller in the Thriller video and told him that it promoted demonology and that they were going to excommunicate him. Branca smartly got John Landis to remove the film canisters from the processing lab and lock them up in his office. Landis said that he heard from Jackson's security chief, Bill Bray, that the star had been in his room with the door locked for three days, refusing to come out. So he drove to Michael's Encino estate and, with Bray, kicked the door down. Michael said he hadn't eaten in three days. So after getting him to the doctor, Landis said that Jackson apologized the following day for wanting to destroy the film, at which point Landis then had to explain to him that they had ignored those orders from the jump. Branca eventually resorted to just lying to his client to preserve the work. He told Vanity Fair, I said, Mike, did you ever watch Bela Lugosi in Dracula? He goes, why? I said, do you know that he was a devout Christian? I was just making it up. (laughs) And I said, did you ever notice there were like disclaimers on those movies? He goes, no. So, Michael, before we destroy this film, let's put a disclaimer on it saying this does not reflect the personal convictions of Michael Jackson. Is that on there? I don't remember that. Oh, yeah. Narrator voice. They did. Oh, yeah. The whole thing opens with, due to my strong personal convictions, I state that this film does not uh, endorse... Let me let you find it. Why am I I trying to paraphrase it? Uh, Due to my strong personal convictions, I wish to stress that this film in no way endorses a belief in the occult. That's just like the title card. Well, that's settled. Thriller premiered at the 500-seat historic Crest Theater, which I believe is the movie theater used in the video itself, attended by the likes of Diana Ross, Warren Beatty, Prince, and Eddie Murphy. John Landis warmed up the audience with a new print of a Mickey Mouse cartoon called The Band Concert, for some reason. Did he have something (laughs) to do with it? Or just, I can imagine Michael just being really pumped to see a Mickey Mouse cartoon. Yeah, Uh, And 14 minutes later... After Thriller had been received with a rapturous standing ovation, Landis found himself stuck with what to do next until Eddie Murphy yelled out, Show the damn thing again! (laughs) Show the damn thing again! (laughs) You could probably cut that. That's verging on the racist. That was pretty good. That was accurate, though. Thanks. (laughs) Uh, The video premiered on MTV on December 2nd, 1983. 
And former MTV executive Les Garland told Vanity Fair the network settled on a saturation strategy, which he describes as, Every time we play Thriller, let's tell them when we're going to play it again. We played it three to five times a day. We were getting audience ratings ten times the usual when we popped Thriller. Showtime, meanwhile, aired Making Michael Jackson's Thriller six times that February. Within months, the Vestron release had sold a million copies, making it at the time the biggest selling home video release ever. Sadly, like so many other things in Michael's life, Thriller was subsumed by the financial chaos of his fame. In January 2009, six months before his death, John Landis and co-producer George Folsey filed suit against Michael Jackson and his company Optimum Productions for breach of contract, alleging that they had not been paid their 50% of royalties in many years and accusing Jackson of, quote, fraudulent, malicious, and oppressive conduct, end quote. So this is good time as any to get into the insane numbers that Thriller, the song and the album, put up. For context, it is important to understand that the American record industry was literally in the toilet before this album came out. It was in its second slump in three years. Well, the United States was still in the middle of a deep recession. Unemployment was at a four-decade high. I am just spitballing here, but I have to assume that the oil shortage played into this. Just for, like, making the actual vinyl? Yeah, maybe. You think? Maybe. Works for me. All right. I won't tell Uh, if you don't. (laughs) <laughs> Billboard reported that record shipments had declined by 50 million units between 1980 wow. and 1982. CBS staffers referred to August 13th, 1982 as Black Friday. Their vice president of merchandising told Reuters, we had a major layoff that day. Half the marketing department was let go at Epic. Good. <laughs> F- them. Anyone that looks like them. <laughs> it's a little training day quote for you. Yeah. Oh man, I should do uh what training day monologues are there? <laughs> yes, yeah, <it's> Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> King Kong, I mean, you gotta do the King Kong one. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I I would like to hear this. I think I think our fans would also I think our I'm listeners putting... would also like to Oh you motherfuckers. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm putting cases on all you bitches. You think you can do this sh-? Jake. <laughs> you think you can do this to me? You motherfuckers will be playing basketball on Pelican Bay when I get finished with you. <laughs> Shoe program. 23 hour lockdown. I'm the man up in this piece. <laughs> Who the f- do you think you're f***ing with? I'm the police. I run sh- around here. You just live here. Yeah, that's right. You better walk away. Go on and walk away, because I'm going to burn this motherfucker down. King Kong ain't got sh- on me. That's right. Sh- I don't... F- I'm winning anyway. I'm winning any motherfucking way. I can't lose. Yeah, you sh- you can shoot me, but you can't kill me. Thank you. <laughs> Probably use we that got a Webby for that. Instead of the Werner Herzog one. <laughs> <laughs> well, originally, the label Epic planned for a Christmas 1982 release for Thriller, but then they were going to push it to January 1983 as Jones and Jackson continued to fiddle with it. But the album leaked to radio and stations began playing multiple cuts, forcing the label to release Thriller on November 30th, 1982. The first single, The Girl Is Mine, of course they went with The Girl Is Mine, it's got Paul McCartney on it, mm-hmm. went to number two. And then the label made the decision to go for broke and release Beat It while Billie Jean was also still climbing the charts. Real flex. Yeah. When the Thriller video came out, sales reduced again. Epic was shipping 1 million copies a week. With 32 million copies sold worldwide by the end of 1983, Thriller became the best-selling album of all time and was ratified by the Guinness Book of World Records on February 7th, 1984, I wonder how much that pissed off Paul McCartney because that is the 20th anniversary of the Beatles' arrival in the United States. It was the best-selling album of 1983 worldwide, and in 1984, it became the first album to become the best-selling in the United States for two years in a row. As of May 2022, Billboard put its global sales at over 100 million copies, though you've seen figures closer to 70 million. Yeah, I'm always interested in sales figures for this kind of stuff. I don't know how people exactly 
certify it. And then especially when you get into nowadays when it's like how many streams count towards a sale right. or whatever. So, but you know, it's still in the top. It's kept from the top slot by their greatest hits by the fucking Eagles. <laughs> It also pulled in eight Grammys with seven for Jackson and one for Bruce. I forgot how to say it already. Sweden. 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 That's it. Uh, Michael Jackson's incredibly high royalty rate, $2 per album, helped him become ludicrously wealthy. So let's think about that. 32 million copies sold worldwide by the end of 1983. $2 an album. So that's $64 million on record sales alone. Good God. Let's see my let's go for the inflation calculator. I'm gonna say I'm what do we 60, say? Sixty four million turns into hundred and ten million is my guess. All right. What is this eighty four you said? Yeah. Hundred and eighty nine almost hundred and eighty nine point six million dollars in today's <laughs> Jesus money. Christ. Not counting tours. Not yeah, counting presumably single sales. Yep. Radio play, man. That's just no one's. Ever, I mean, that's it. That's the top of the mountain. That's that's yeah. exactly it. And it's it's so funny because this album. I mean, obviously, what do you do? It be, but it did become something of the albatross around Jackson's neck, and he fully expected it. Perhaps in the depths of his delusion that this would just be a stepping stone onto bigger and better things. Um, there's, a, I think, there's a quote. Uh, it's from one of his team at some point where they're like, "Well, you know, Michael, how do you how do you feel?" And he's like, "Well, the next one's going to be bigger." Like, I think he expected bad to sell, like, or no, you know what it was? It was, he was disappointed when bad came out and sold 20 million because he thought it was going to sell better than Thriller. But yeah, man, I mean, it's just like, yeah, where do you go from the top of the world? <laughs> you go on a post 9 11 road trip with Elizabeth Taylor <laughs> and maybe hang out in your private zoo. Was that Elizabeth Taylor 9-11 thing disproved? Did that actually happen? I think it was disproved, yeah. Ah, bummer. It's Michael Jackson, Elizabeth Taylor, and Marlon Brando? I thought it was someone weirder. For those of you who have no idea what we're talking about, there's a, a, a I'll call it an urban legend that on 9-11, um, Elizabeth Taylor, Michael Jackson, and somebody else, I thought it was Marlon Brando, fled, It was Marlon Brando, you're correct. Okay. Yeah. Fled New York City in a rental car. I don't think they even had a driver. I think they the, in the story they all took turns driving. Yes, and this, disproved, disproved yes. by um, Tim Mendelson, a trustee of Elizabeth Taylor's estate. I think Liz Leonard wrote that. She sure did. Liz McNeil wrote that. Yep, yeah, Liz McNeil, white people, people colleague, bomber. Well, I have a question for you about Thriller before we end. Um, Go ahead. Did it end up? It, <laughs> did it end up in the Library of Congress? It sure did. Record. Sure Good. Did, Thank buddy. God. Thank God. <laughs> it truly is the top of the mountain. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, it's like we were saying at the top of the episode, like, it's f***ing thriller, man. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy Griffin writes in Vanity Fair, it just feels like not just a, a, a high water mark for music, but culture, period. Uh, she wrote, thriller seems like the last time everyone on the planet got excited at the same time by the same thing. No matter where you went in the world, they were playing those songs. You could dance to them. Since then, the fragmentation of pop culture has destroyed our sense of collective exhilaration, and I miss that. Well, folks, this has been Too Much Information. Thank you for listening. Thank you for hanging tough with us. On Halloween. On Should Halloween. Are we taping this on taping Halloween? this on Halloween. Uh, I'm Alex Heigl. And I'm Jordan Runtog. We'll catch you next time. Well, folks, after we stopped recording, uh, Heigl delivered us a little treat. Thankfully, uh, I had a backup recorder going, so please enjoy. You know what you look like to me with your good bag and your cheap shoes? You look like a rube, a well-scrubbed, hustling rube with a little taste. Good nutrition's giving you some length of bone, but you're not more than one generation from poor white trash, are you, Agent Starling? And that accent you've tried so desperately to shed, pure West Virginia. What is your father, dear? Is he a coal miner? Does he stink of the lamp? You know how quickly the boys found you. All those tedious, sticky fumblings in the back seats of cars. Why, you could only dream of getting out. Getting anywhere. Getting all the way to the FBI. <laughs>
Too Much Information was a production of iHeartRadio. The show's executive producers are Noel Brown and Jordan Runtog. The show's supervising producer is Michael Alder June. The show was researched, written, and hosted by Jordan Runtog and Alex Heigl. With original music by Seth Applebaum and the Ghost Funk Orchestra. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. For more podcasts on iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 